So I wanted to talk a little bit about, um, uh, I guess, modernism uh, as, a, as a concept. And I would say that one of the things about modernism, uh, which is similar to improvised music, is that the process, the materials that we use, are an integral part of the finished work. So you see the brush strokes, the construction is part of the piece. Also, I think one of the major um, contributions to 20th century art was juxtaposition. Now, if you look at uh, newspapers from the 19th century, and this is using uh, Western script, you will find the style very discursive. But if you look at newspapers in the 20th century, because of cut and paste, you have this juxtaposition. There's this idea here, there's that idea there, there's that one there. And like um, cut and paste, this also fits in with the digital age very well. Now, as I spoke before, one of the uh, analogies I used was that there's an urban way of listening and playing where our lives are in compartments. We're one person at home, we're another person on the bus or the tube, we're another person in the office or at school, we're another person. So we're this, this, we're this series of discrete juxtapositions. And for me that represents a kind of urban thing, uh, a city uh, view. Now there's also, of course, I mentioned the rural, the country way which is also part of, of uh, what we do. This is when a farmer has some land, and maybe the first year he puts water there, so you can have water to irrigate the land. The next year's fertilizer. The next year builds a barn. So this grows from a central point out, and this is how our, if you like, our consciousness sort of works. We start off not kind of knowing very much, but it grows. And of course we embrace chance and accident and things that we don't know where it comes from. This I call the quantum rabbit that just pops up and says, hello, I'm here, hello, I'm here. We don't know the connections between, in the same way electrons across the universe can be entangled. One works here and it affects one the other side of the universe. We don't know the connections. So, um, yes, so getting back to the initial point uh, of the what we're doing is actually, a, I feel, a sort of modernist thing rather than a post-modernist thing. It's something that uh, I, I kind of tend to find post-modernism uh, doesn't quite put things in a real context, if you like. If you look at YouTube, you have John Coltrane, uh, some K-pop group, uh, uh, Mozart, they're all there in the same time. So there's not this sense of context and consequence which happens within the improvising world. And one of the things that unites us as humans is our ability to understand context and to see consequence. And it's this strategic planning that we use also when we improvise. When we improvise, the instrument is very important. We have a dialogue with the instrument. Uh, we're not transhuman. We don't wear a foil helmet and think music and it happens. Um, that's not to say that we can't have a sense of wonderment uh, about, without getting religious, it's still possible to 
wonder at the cosmos and at the existence and how amazing it is. Wow! There are so many astounding things. For instance, uh, if we took all the matter from the whole human race and took all the space out between the atoms, it would be very heavy mass, but just the size of a sugar cube. This is held together by very weak electronic, electric stuff. But it feels hard, but there's, there's hardly anything there. And for me, that's wow. And that's part of what we express when we, when we look at the world, is this sense of, of wow, wonderment. Personally, I think it's no accident that uh, when public libraries began at the, uh, I guess, the end of the 19th century, uh, ordinary working people had access to education and began reading. And also, they began various theories of mysticism and all kinds of things like this. And I think that that kind of sense of wow is somehow embedded in early early modernism. It has a kind of universal uh, feel to it somehow. So, enough of an old man talking about outer space. <laughs> Let's play the Musashino spaceship. So they're out in the outer reaches of the galaxy. Great, huge, spacey, bushy, squishy sounds. Please. <laughs> oh. <laughs> we just crashed the
really out of space music. <laughs> It's, uh, it really felt, and the, and the fade ending, I think, works with that. It's like the ship's just travelling over and just going into the distance, you know. And uh, uh, it, it was really good, and you were, you were listening to each other, which is, which is wonderful, because that's what it's about. It's about uh, developing the year. So, in 1938 uh, is when John Cage... Uh, said that he first uh, wrote a piece for Air Piano, uh, but actually it was published in 1940. Uh, but he got the idea, he, he wanted to work with a dancer, and he wanted a percussion ensemble, but there wasn't room for a percussion ensemble, so he turned the piano into a percussion ensemble by putting things between the strings. Um, and he said he was also influenced in that by another American composer who was before him, who in 1922 used to brush, he called it uh, string piano, and he used to play inside the piano, brushing the strings into the piano. And before that was an English composer, Ezra Reed, who in the 1880s used to write popular works for the piano, uh, Victorians, houses, everybody had a piano, you know. Uh, if they could afford one, of course. Uh, and he'd write pieces where people would have uh, bells around their wrists and play Christmas songs and things like this. So that was a kind of, uh, also a kind of prepared piano. So this is called extended technique and kind of fits into the, what I was saying about modernism, where the practice of what you're, what you're doing, how you're producing the sound, is also part of the, the work. It's an integral part of the work. And that dialogue with the instrument, with the uh, means, of, means of production, actually, means of production of the sound, is an important part of, of, of music making, of any art. And if you remember, I spoke about the nature of sound, but it starts with an attack, a sustain, and a decay. So the initial excitement of something, by hitting it, rubbing it, blowing on it, scraping it, makes the attack. And then you can also modulate the sustain. For instance, with a cymbal, you can hit the cymbal and then hold it like that, so that you damp the sound. And there are many ways in which you can uh, use objects with the instrument as pre to prepare the instrument. So, so what I'm going to do now is to, uh, uh, we're very lucky to have uh, Akihara-san here, and he has a rather little treasure chest of things here that he uses to play the guitar with. So I'm going to ask him if he'd be kind enough to demonstrate some of them. So you can see from here, this is the rubber band around here across the strings and it damps the strings and allows this rather, rather lovely, very percussive, almost like a kind of marimba or something like this. And it's, and it's over uh, um, uh, what they call a node. Yes, yeah. So, uh, so 
there's a thing called the harmonic series, where you have the first harmonic is an octave, which is if you have a string, if you go halfway between the string, and the string is vibrating in two parts, um, and the string in the middle, where it doesn't vibrate, is called the node. And then you can divide it, the string into three parts, and the string does this, and into four parts, and so on. And that's the harmonic series, uh, first written about by the Greek mathematician Pythagoras, I think. And one of the interesting things about this is that our ears hear uh, in the harmonic series. If you have a very cheap small speaker, you can hear below the fundamental. The speaker might only vibrate, say, at 500 cycles a second. So you can hear bass notes at 100 cycles a second, really low notes. Because the, although the air isn't moving like that, the ear infers from the higher notes in the harmonic series, it infers the lower notes. So if you have a very small cheap speaker, you can still hear the bass notes because your brain is telling you that those notes are there. Harmonic series, do you know what you mean? Harmonic series, the guidance. What you thought about now is the kind of the sound. Sub fundamental. The sound is only you could hear in the brain. So yes, uh, yes. Not, not, not that you from the... No, no, uh, the sub-fundamental. Yeah, the brain So this is another example of how we create the sound. Out there it's air moving, but when it hits the tympanum, our brains create the sound, and that is what listening is. Which is a very strange thing. It's, it's like that thing that this is not much matter at all, really. It's electrical waves. It's, it's, one of, it's another one of those very strange, mysterious things in the world. So we can never be sure, really, of anything, which is a good reason for improvising. So let's try the uh, conducting. Two conductors, please. Right. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, the lines of communication are now open. <laughs> Two directions. 
So you have to listen to the whole. You have to listen to the whole group, and then we'll have we'll create a sound that kind of moves moves around like a, a the Pink Floyd that uh, rock group used to have a thing called an azimuth coordinator where they move the sound through 360 degrees. You know, so we should have that moving sound around the room. Asimuth coordinator. Okay, so uh, let's turn the uh, telephone company on again. Exchange is open.
conservation and global warming, I think, so we don't need a big machine to do that. And in fact, that um, uh, uh, churches and temples, uh, hundreds of years ago, the music was actually designed sometimes with the architecture of the building in mind. So certain things would resonate more than others within that building. So that also demonstrates one of the eight aspects of sound how the brain hears, and that is location. The only thing I uh, am a little bit concerned with, apart from everybody being lost, is that if we do have an audience sitting in the middle tomorrow, they don't have a stiff neck by looking around to where the sound's coming from. <laughs> Maybe if we put them on chairs with costas, they can spin around. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> okay, so let's now do the voice piece. So, voices only, please. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
wonderful. <laughs> it's of course a very human sound, so it's very, very warm. It's, uh, uh, it's the first instrument we have, it's our voice, I think. Uh, uh, so, there's a thing called uh, prepared piano, it's, it's one thing called prepared guitar, but there's also extended technique, is another term. And extended vocal technique is used by, as it's referred to, I mean, uh, it's used in the West as techniques that aren't traditional with Western singing techniques. So um, it's a bit discriminatory, I feel, because uh, yodeling, for instance, from Austria, is maybe seen as an extended technique, but it's actually a traditional vocal style. Uh, shamanistic throat singing is seen as an extended vocal technique, but it's actually a traditional style. But anyway, it is something you can have a lot of fun with in the shower or wherever. So you can make so many different sounds with the voice, with the, and you can sing using the diaphragm, you can sing using the, just this bit. Uh, if you listen to opera singers, uh, for instance, um, Richard Talbot would sing, Scan into a garden, board, a garden, it's very good, like this, you know. Whereas you see Billing, the tenor, would sing, Calm into the garden, with a very open throat. So there's so many different ways you can use the voice. I must say they were the worst impressions of two great opera singers I've ever heard. Um, but there are plenty of people to listen to, um, both male and female vocalists. Uh, for instance, um, Ucha Fasserman, Maggie Nichols, Ucha Fasserman, Ucha Fasserman, Maggie Nichols, Phil Minton, uh, there's a guy in Taiwan, Fang Yi Liu. Fang Yi Liu, you Taiwan. There's there's many, there's many. And be careful is the only thing. Don't spend a week going because you'll have a very sore throat and you might do permanent damage. Um, yes, rest in between doing stroking things. Okay, let's do the John Stevens piece, Search and Reflect, now. This is where you start by listening to the sounds in the environment, and then you listen to the person next to you, incorporate that in your sound, and the person next to them, and the person next to them, and so on, until you can hear the whole group. Oh, I mind your sound, just start. Uh, 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 the person next to them, and so on, until you can hear the whole group and you're hearing everything simultaneously. Um, the, and if you find you can't hear someone, then you go back to the start and start again. And don't forget this illustrates the point that also uh, that music is different from painting. If you were uh, improvising together on a, on, say, an actual painting, you wouldn't be able to focus on everything at the same time. But whereas with sound, you should be able to hear every every sound at any particular time. So this helps develop what Pauline Oliveras calls deep listening.
Creatures making sound, and even the smallest sound, I don't know how the, the little grasshopper manages to do it, but it can cut through somewhere, it finds its space. So, the tendency for this, this search and reflect piece, and it, and it goes back to the spontaneous music ensemble, the more quantalistic, because if you're playing uh, a kind of AMM laminar style legato. Uh, then you mask what the other people are doing. I remember talking with um, Kondo Hoshinori again. I was in a trio with him and Roger Turner. And Kondo's, Kondo and Roger were quite loud and I was playing an acoustic guitar with no amplification. And Kondo said to me, yes, but if I play a big blue mountain and Roger plays a, a big yellow square, he can play a, a small green triangle, but of course that's a painting. In sound, if something's louder, it covers up what's, what's there, and if it continues, then it, it masks, which is one of the tools we were talking about, masking and framing. But in this piece, we don't want any masking, we want transparency. It's about transparency, and it's about hearing all the individual elements. So please leave space, and please try and find space. So let's let's try again. Uh, there's a break, isn't there? For, for stuff here. Uh, in three minutes. Three minutes. <laughs> so, so let's. Only one minute. One minute. <laughs> <laughs> uh, should we get? Should we break a little bit early then, and we'll come back to it? So. Okay, so uh, let's go back to the John Stevens piece, search and reflect. And uh, please think uh, transparency, rainforest, 
And staccato. Oh, sorry, before you start, um, let's start from absolute silence listening to what small sounds we can hear. And don't forget to go back to the start if you feel you can't hear everybody in the group.
Okay, everybody ready then?
it sounds it sounds great. It really it really does because we've got the we've got the spaceship and we've got that and that pull up sounds certainly reflect a telephone a more open spacey sort of sounds. You know, so we've got we've got that juxtaposition and contrast, and then we've got the five short pieces to come. And again, they're, they're each contrasting short pieces, and we've got the number class forever, the bubble piece. So I, I think that's, that's a, a good set of pieces to do, to go out. And maybe we should do the program twice. Keep the pieces short and just do them, do them twice. Because we're it was good about two, not three. Because two is easy to work. Yes, yes. And then, yes. But maybe they, they could uh, have a look at, at each other or Yes, yeah.
コアもみんなできてますか、うん To count really, really slowly, uh, and don't be frightened if there's a lot, if there's quite a lot of silence, and you still have one bubble to play. Because I think that's quite nice. I'd like to talk a little bit about what aesthetics, I suppose. Um, how do we? Leo Smith, the uh, trumpet player, known now as Madonna, Leo Smith, uh, black American uh, musician said with free improvisation, because it comes into being now, you can't have a critique. It brings its own aesthetics with it. So how do you judge whether it's good or bad? And it's a very personal feeling. Uh, for me, if it's engaging, I think it's good. You know, if it, if it engages me, it's good. If uh, there's a tension there, I think it's good. Sometimes even with no intention and you know, people are a little bit bored, sometimes the music is still good. So it's very much a, a personal thing. And we judge it as it happens. For me, the important thing is honesty and authenticity. Uh, it's not about pretending to be something that we are not. まあ、私が大事だと思うのは正直であれということ、それとまあ正当、忠実に何か自分に行うということ、つまり自分以外の何者かになろうとしないことですね。Again, I feel that puts what we do in in the world of modernism um, in that it's not reproductions pasted together uh, from different places. 
まあ、これもまたモダニズムのねお話をしたそこにえかかってくると思いますがえ何かを再度生産するとかえ切り張りをしてといったものではない。It's something that's true to its time when it happens. There's a very nice essay which you may have read、uh, called The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction by Walter Benjamin. And in it, he talks about images of the Mona Lisa. You see the Mona Lisa in books. And, you know, what does that mean to this painting? We see so many copies of it. What is authentic?、Uh, truly improvised music happens in the present, in the here and now, and that's where it gets its authenticity from. Now, I've had various criticisms in the past where people say, Oh, your music is、uh, too advanced. We have to wait for people to catch up, and maybe in a hundred years, people will like that music. But you can't play a music for the future. You can only play a music from where you are now. And that's the same in any creative endeavour. That's part of the authenticity. Be true to yourselves and the, the context and time in which you make your work. Now, many years ago, I had a neighbour who said to me, The only reason you're playing that music is a gimmick in order to make money. Which、uh, is patently not true.、Um, as I said before,、uh, money is a, an extrinsic value. The work, the quality of the work, Has its intrinsic value, that is the real value, not、uh, a marketplace value. Naturally, it's important to be practical, we all need to eat. Now, this reminds me of a story of a man who was walking through town and he heard a frog in the street. And the frog was saying, Help me, help me, please help me, Mr. Man. And the man bent down and picked up the frog, and the frog said, I'm not really a frog. I'm the best improvising musician in the world. And if, and if you take me home and your wife kisses me, I won't be a frog anymore. I will be the best improvising musician in the world. So the man puts the frog in his pocket and goes home to his wife. Takes the frog out of his pocket and the frog says, Oh, thank you, Mr. Man. Hello, Mrs. Woman. I'm not really a frog. I'm the best improvising musician in the world. And if you kiss me, I won't be a frog anymore. I'll turn into the best improvising musician in the world. And the woman puckers her lips, about to kiss the frog, when the man puts the frog back in his pocket. And she says, What are you doing? And he says, Don't be stupid. You can make far more money from a talking frog than an improvising musician. <laughs> <laughs> We're not necessarily in it for the money, we do it because we love the music. And the real value comes from the music, otherwise, we'd all be talking frogs. Okay, let's do the、um, five short pieces. The Kunz Prisman five short pieces. So, if you remember, they're one minute long. The material in the second piece has to contrast with the material in the first piece, the material in the third piece contrasting with the second piece, and so on, with a short break of silence. Uh, and don't develop the material. So, the material you start with for the first minute, you stick with that, the second one, stick with that. So, again, it's this notion of juxtaposition, cut and paste. You see it in the work of Kutch Fitters, for instance, in the sense that it's cut and paste. It's cut and paste, juxtaposition. So, we are juxtaposing. Through time, each of the five pieces are contrasting pieces. Okay, so over to you. <laughs>
instrumental technique and it seems to me it's uh, exemplified a bit in that piece because when you play each section you're trying to find a different mental space before you play the next movement and if you like that's a kind of pre-instrumental technique it's a little bit I don't know much about uh, martial arts and things but it's a bit like say it's monkey style so you you know, you get into that mood and then that's your, your uh, fighting style or whatever. So this is one way we can use our feelings and our emotions is to, is to get into a, a mental state which opens up particular avenues of creativity. So I'm just about done now. We've got uh, 12 minutes or so before 4 o'clock. And if you have any questions, now's, now's the time. Or well, it doesn't have to be questions, it can be observations. <coughs> I'm 
I, th I think that uh, the, the, the listening thing is slightly different in that piece, uh, which, which is why the, why the music somehow sounds different from the previous music we played. Uh, and that's because there's a, there's a kind of intransigence of approach. You kind of dig your heels in and I'm doing this sound now for one minute. So in that sense, you're not bouncing off each other's ideas in the same way. But nevertheless, we're still polite people. I mean, we're not uh, um, doing one thing very quietly and then something really loud that uh, just blows everybody else away. We still have this sense of orchestration of what the group <coughs> sounds like in our heads. There's also, um, although I've been uh, talking about listening a lot this week, there's also the thing of kind of creative not listening. Uh, sometimes this can resemble automatic writing, the surrealist technique, so it becomes like just a flow of consciousness. And sometimes you can use this judiciously, shall we say, uh, um, a little bit to ignore something sometimes, but don't forget you're in a group. So, the other thing we didn't do today, which uh, I, I remembered, was the thing that uh, I mentioned Chettle Goodwig and his friend, who plays a, a tune in his head, but he doesn't actually play the tune, he relates to the tune in his head. So maybe for the last five minutes we can uh, think of a tune that we only imagine in our heads, but we, we accompany that tune. We're still within the group, but there's an element of this uh, belligerence or intransigence or not listening also, because we're listening to this inner tune in our head. So in the same way that you might be walking down the street, there's lots of other people there, but you're in your own thoughts, but you're not bumping into each other. You're, you're kind of looking out for your fellow pedestrians. So maybe you can call this going for a stroll.
sort of drunken dance band or something. It was, it was, it was very nice. <laughs> There's uh, uh, another piece it reminded me of, which is The Sinking of the Titanic, a piece by Gavin Bryan. And uh, Gavin uh, um, wrote about the, well, it's obvious from the title, about the Titanic sinking. And he used the fact that sound travels seven times faster in water, and the sounds on the boat would still be going around the sea. Uh, and it was the sounds of the boat in the sea. There was a string quartet that was actually playing as the boat sank, playing a song nearer my god to thee. And uh, it was part of the piece. And, and what you played then sort of reminded me of that kind of thing like that. Very nice. So, we've covered quite a lot of ground this week, and tomorrow we uh, go through our program twice. Now, if I don't get a chance, don't forget Mopomoso, M-O-P-O-M-O-S-O dot -O 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 com. And if you put my name on the front of that, J Russell at Mopomoso dot com, you can send me an email if you have any questions about improvising, anything like that. And if I get time, because I get quite a lot of emails, but if I get time, I'll try and answer. Uh, so nothing urgent, please. But. Uh, uh, I, I say this to all my pupils, if I can help, I will. And give yourselves a round of, of applause, you've done great. Well done.